NATO must be prepared for Russian missile strikes in Europe. At least that is the opinion of high-ranking generals of the alliance who were interviewed by the Times. In particular, Lieutenant General Alexander Zalfrank, the commander of NATO's military logistics center in southeast Germany, urged the Allies to deal with the bureaucracy which stands in the way of troop and equipment shifting and restricts the member countries' use of weaponry. Like other generals from Germany, the U.S. and the Netherlands, he fears that Russia might strike civilian and military infrastructure very far from the front lines and deep in European territory. The Times states that it might happen within the next three years. Discussions of a potential war in Europe are getting louder. The Baltic states are building bunkers on their borders with Russia. Lithuania and Poland are fearing an attack on the Sivalki Gap. Sweden and Norway are reinforcing their respective civilian defenses and are planning on expanding their submarine fleet. Is a new all-European war imminent? Philip Breedlove, ex-commander of U.S. European Command and former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO Allied Command Operations, will help us answer this question. Hello, Philip. Good morning here yeah. from Florida. I'm sure it's afternoon to you. Yes, it is afternoon here, peak workday hours. Thank you very much for finding the time to speak with us. Well, we keep hearing very worrisome claims, and not from anonymous sources or experts, but from government officials. Do you think the war between Russia and NATO is inevitable? I do not think that it is inevitable. I do believe that Mr. Putin understands what a NATO border and a NATO country is. But clearly, Mr. Putin has made bad decisions in the past, and that does not mean that he will not make more bad decisions in the future. So rather than trying to predict what he does, I think it's important that NATO prepares. NATO works on its readiness, and NATO also continues to help those that are not in NATO who come under Russian attack. European politicians and military officials are discussing this next big war more and more frequently and again with certainty that it is inevitable. And I do understand what you're saying and certainly understand that there is a multitude of ways this can turn out. But do you think that these politicians and military officials view Ukraine standing in this war as completely hopeless? Can we say that there is now a new consensus in the West that Kiev is incapable of defeating Russia? I think it's very clear, I, actually also to Mr. Putin, that he cannot conventionally defeat NATO. The brave soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen of Ukraine have nearly defeated him now in the field in Ukraine, much less the entire weight and capability of NATO. So I believe Mr. Putin is depending on his ability to threaten and to coerce NATO uh, with its nuclear uh, arsenal. You saw about a week ago when Medvedev threatened nukes once again if Ukraine were to use Western equipment to strike Russia. And so this is where Russia counts on their ability to to threaten and to coerce the West with these nuclear weapons and widening war. But I believe it's important for us all to realize that in a conventional sense, in a conventional war on the battlefields of Europe, Russia would be defeated. По ситуации на земле в Украине, господин Бридлов, вы как человек, который понимает лучше гораздо, ну не знаю, меня, по крайней мере, лучше, и огромное большинство людей... Mr. Бридлов, let's turn to the situation on the ground in Ukraine. How would you, as someone who understands this better than me or other people without military experience, describe Ukraine standing in the war today? Are terms such as stalemate, stagnation or trench warfare applicable? Are there any beneficiaries of the situation as it is today? And is there a possibility of a breakthrough in the short term? Well, first, I do not agree with the use of the word stalemate. Um, there are a lot of things going on on the battlefield now that certainly do not indicate a stalemate. Let's just think about a few of them. In the Black Sea, Ukraine's Navy, without any capital ships, no battleships like Russia, has essentially moved Russian Navy away from Crimea and back towards Russian ports. 
the Ukrainian Navy and naval uh, activities have dealt some very severe blows to Russia's Navy, and that is not a stalemate. And it is getting worse for Russia in the Black Sea rather than better. Ukraine's air forces, if you will call them, their drone forces and their their ability to strike Russia via these first person video and other types of drones is taking an increasing toll on Russia. And while Ukraine has a very small and very old air force now, it will get better over time. And Ukraine's ability to strike Russia from the air will continue to increase. So I do not see the air war as a stalemate either. But we have to acknowledge there also that Russia using uh, Iranian and North Korean equipment continues to strike Ukraine as well. And so the air war is not a stalemate, but needs to be worked out. On the ground at the moment, people talk about this as a positional war. I, I won't argue with that. But I don't call it a stalemate because Ukraine is taking a huge toll on the Russian forces. Tens of thousands of Russian soldiers dying, and this fight is at an incredible cost to Russia right now. So while the lines are not moving very much, Russia's military is being hammered on the ground as they try to attack Ukraine. But when I speak of a stalemate or trench warfare, whichever you prefer, I mostly speak of the counteroffensive that was so promising in the beginning, and by now everyone's tired of discussing its failures. But I would like to ask you about the future. Is a counteroffensive of a similar scale, albeit hopefully with different results, possible within 2024? Could there still be a breakthrough on the front lines? Perhaps in the spring or next winter, as some experts have prognosed. Well, here's how I think about it. Um, if if our forces were on the ground in Ukraine, we would first establish local battlefield air superiority, and we would establish the capability to strike deeply with our rocket and artillery forces so that we could bring the enemy under fire where he assembles in Russia, and as he attacks, into Ukraine and as he fights in Ukraine. And so any counteroffensive would first be after establishing this air superiority so that we can, one, protect our own troops, and two, to strike at our time and place of choosing the enemy's troops. And so before we expect Ukraine to make any great offensive, we in the West have to supply what Ukraine needs to start that offensive, to establish battlefield air superiority, to have the ability to strike deeply and persistently and precisely the enemy where he uh, gathers. Well, apparently the West is not very keen on supplying this very weaponry that Kiev is demanding. So what should we conclude from this inaction? We need to be leaders. Right now, we are not leading. Uh, I have told people more than once that the brave soldiers of Ukraine will fight with us or without us. And how this war ends completely depends on how the West supports Ukraine. And so the West has to step up to its responsibilities and its promises and give Ukraine what it needs to fight. And when, and I say when because I expect it to happen, when the West finally makes this move to give Ukraine what it needs to win, not simply to continue to fight, but when we give Ukraine what it needs to win, Ukraine will win. I don't know if you perhaps know Zeluzhny personally, but many are convinced that this opposition is what's causing both Ukraine's failures on the battlefield and Zelensky's underachievements on the international political arena. How problematic would you say Zeluzhny's dismissal could be if it were to happen? Well, I would, I would really rather avoid these kind of uh, discussions. Here's what I do believe. General Zeluzhny has been giving his advice to President Zelensky 
President Zelensky is the supreme commander. And in the United States and most Western nations, we really believe in civilian control of the military. And so I would hope that these two great leaders can work this out to the benefit of the Ukrainian troops. Ukrainian troops need to be able to look up and see solidarity in their chain of command. And so it's my desire that these two leaders work this out. Thank you very much. This has been Philip Breedlove, retired USAF general. We discussed the ongoing war as well as the potential new war between NATO and Russia, which is a topic of discussion among many European politicians, especially those in Eastern Europe.